Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 148 of the It's a Pictures podcast. My name is John Gilpatrick, and joining me, as always, is the co-hostess with the mostest, Max Colville. I think this is our first, like, proper two-hander in a while. Yeah, it's been Without, a while. We've had, we've had a lot of just, guests. Just you and I, no guests. Have we done any this calendar year yet? We must have. Yeah, we must have. I, I, I find it hard to believe that we ha- wouldn't have done it this calendar year. I'm not sure we have, but I could be wrong. Um, uh, it's nice to be chatting with you. Um, it feels like it kind of time flew by. I don't really know where it went since we recorded last, which was uh, very shortly after the Oscars, and we had a very great chat about that. Um, but uh, I guess sort of the big thing that's happened in the meantime is the uh, NCAA tournament, which I know you know we're both, I guess, fans of in some sense, right? Yeah, I like watching it. I do too. I'm not like uh, as attached to it as I feel like maybe I was when I was in high school and stuff and college basketball was super hot, but um, it's been fun. Uh, really weird year. Uh, your Providence Friar. Is it, am I fair, is it okay to say your Providence Friars? Yeah, that's fair. Cause you, you know, that they're a hometown team. You, you gotta say that you, you like them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They uh, did not advance, unfortunately. Um, but they were, uh, you know, uh, they could have easily made it to the final four with how many like weird teams seem to make it this year. Um, but uh, I don't know. We're, uh, you know, a couple of days away now from the final four games and the championship. Is there, what do you think is going to happen from here on out? I, it seems like UConn is the favorite to, to win it all. Um... Definitely are. I mean, they're like the, you know, kind of team amongst the four that, he feels like kind of belongs, not just because of their pedigree, but based off of how they perform this year. Right. And even winning their uh, conference championship, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say so. Florida Atlantic would be fun. Um, I don't really have much uh, connection to Miami or San Diego State moving on like super far. It doesn't feel like, even though there's a lot of random randomness, it doesn't feel like we ended up with like, an amazing like sort of Cinderella story, I guess like Florida Atlantic is pretty good, but I don't have the same attachment to them that I did um, teams in the past that like were of a similar caliber. I feel like part of that is that like they never really took out like a number one seed. Like they didn't. Yeah. I feel like whenever there's a team like this that moves on, it's like because they slay Goliath and like their Goliath, I guess was like Tennessee yeah, <laughs> uh, didn't feel Goliathy like they got to play Fairleigh Dickinson, which was like the Cinderella team that beat the number one seed. So it's just it's kind of like a little bit weird, but uh, but it's been fun. I, you know, I think it's been a fun tournament. I'm excited to see what happens. The women's tournament is uh, also at its final four, and I don't follow it super closely, um, but I will say I filled out a bracket anyway for a contest, and I got the final four exactly correct. So I was very excited about that. Wow. <laughs> I know. And then somebody told me that like, it wasn't exactly a stretch what I predicted, but still like, you know, I was pretty pumped about that. Yeah. And I, I think like hand it to sports media or whatever, but I think they're doing a better job of highlighting the women's tournament this year than they have in the past. It, they really it are. Like, yeah. It seems like it's much uh, more exciting or at least they're giving more access to it. Um, one of the elite eight games uh, between Iowa and Louisville and Iowa has kind of like the breakout star of women's uh, basketball this year, Caitlin Clark. Um, they said that game um, had a higher television rating on ESPN than any NBA game this entire season, um, wow. which I thought was a pretty amazing stat. Um, and I know the men's basketball tournament has been drawing really well on TV as well. So, um, you know, I think maybe premature, uh, you know, uh, a eulogy for college hoops here both on the men's and the women's side uh amongst the public like people seem to be enjoying this year's tournaments um even if it's not necessarily the teams that you expect right or in my case in the women's tournament the ones you absolutely did expect um <laughs> but uh another march madness continues on um uh, every year, the Blank Check podcast does their March Madness bracket where fans get to vote on the, you know, an upcoming series of uh, director that they'll cover. 
Um, this year's theme was the uh, World Cup, so it was all international filmmakers, not necessarily foreign language filmmakers. That was, I think, a little bit of a controversial topic with a lot of English filmographies moving, you know, forward in the tournament, but uh, it too is at its final four. Um, and, you know, they managed to do a pretty good job of uh, eliminating those pesky Englishmen and Aussies. Um, and uh, the final four is uh, Park Chan Wook, uh, Guillermo del Toro, uh, Bong Joon Ho, and Wong Kar Wai. So um, I know, I, I suspect where your sort of loyalty would lie for this, Max, but why don't you, um, do you want to? uh you know put your stamp of approval on one of those four great filmmakers yeah i mean like i any one of them i'd probably turn in for a few episodes like i'm not a huge blank check follower but like when they cover a movie that i'm particularly interested in or, or fond of i'll tune in and watch it but um of the four like probably like Park Chan Wook is the the one i'm the least familiar with even though i've seen like maybe four of his movies Uh uh-huh um so I'm, I'm very fond of all of them but probably like one car y is my favorite like as, as you'd imagine um, that's what i would have expected for sure yeah yeah i um i'm kind of in the similar boat on park chan wook uh although yeah i'm kind of curious about all uh i would say all three of the um uh asian directors um you know, I've seen a couple movies, uh, would definitely like to see more. I feel like I'm probably more familiar with Bong, followed by Wong Kar Wai, followed by Park Chan-wook. Um, I will say I was rooting for Peter Weir in the uh, Peter Weir versus Park Chan-wook Elite Eight matchup <laughs> for uh, the Master and Commander to finally make it in. Um, but uh, Guillermo del Toro, somebody whose filmography I've maybe seen everything or close to it. Um, and uh, obviously I'm a big fan of his. So, you know, part part of me is rooting for that just because like it'd just be an easy listen for me um, having seen most of that stuff. But, um, you know, either way, I think they the fans managed to get down to a pretty solid crew. Um, and uh, I would imagine that, you know, at the very least, I would say Del Toro and Bong Joon-ho are pretty you know, pretty much locks for, for a mini series in the future if they don't win this. Um, not to say the other guys wouldn't get there either, but I think Bong Joon-ho and Guillermo del Toro fit the criteria, you know, pretty, pretty much to a T and it would be surprised if they don't get covered. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, we'll see what happens, um, on the, I don't know if, I don't think you're a patron, but on the Patreon side, um, I think Philip K. Dick is going to win for uh, the uh, audio commentary uh, contest. Could be Oceans. I'm not really sure. Uh, but uh, I'm interested in that as well. Oh, you're you a Patreon, huh? I am a patron. Oh, it's, you you are a big fan of Blank Check. I have two patrons, I, Patreons I subscribe to, and that was one of them. Um... But yeah, uh, so um, what else? Movie news, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, lots of con news, right? It seemed like this was the unofficial kickoff to can season. Yeah, like there's a lot of stuff like leaking out and yeah. uh, information. Like so, so, some movies that we can expect there, like um, other than Killers of the Flower Moon now, we can also expect probably Asteroid City, which is the new yeah. Wes Anderson, which trailer comes out tomorrow by the time you hear this you won't be able to see it (laughs) poster Um, came out today or yesterday yeah and then also they're saying indiana jones and the dial of destiny will probably premiere there as well that's gonna get the top gun maverick slot although uh i don't remember the timing but i feel like top gun maverick had already come out no it was like a week before oh was it okay yeah and when does indiana jones come out is that memorial day or is that later in the summer it might have been june Okay. Because Crystal Skull came out Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. But that was many years ago. Um, So, uh, yeah, so that'll be showing at Con Killers of the Flower Moon. Did they say whether Killers of the Flower Moon was going to be in competition or not? Mm, I don't think so, but they did say that it's going to have a uh, limited release at the beginning of October in theaters and then like a more general release maybe like two or three weeks after that in theaters and then it will stream on apple tv 
plus, but I imagine, like, I, I was just throwing it out there. It's probably either going to be Thanksgiving or Christmas, because that's, that's where I would imagine Apple and Paramount would want to put it on the streaming that's service. That's why it's going to be streaming. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I also am a little bit disappointed we're not going to see it sooner, because it seemed like the thing was has been done for a while, that everybody was... Uh, assuming that uh, con premiere was in the cards and that maybe we could get to see it sometime after that, but um, it's going to be a little bit longer than I was expecting or hoping for. So I'm a little bit bummed about that, but yeah, I imagine like it's going to do can and then they'll hold it and then they'll do Telluride or TIFF as well. Yeah. The of September. So, but you know, probably indicative of, they think that it's got the goods to go all the way if they're going to hold it till the fall. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that it's going to get a, uh, you know, something of a theatrical release, even though it's, a uh, you know, owned by a streaming company. Well, it's, it's, it's Paramount is handling the theatrical distribution. I think it's like, yeah, but I don't think that that was like a given considering that like Coda went right to Apple TV plus. Mm. We'll see. No, it was good. I'm glad I'm, I'm, I would like to see it in theaters. I yeah. was not sure that that was going to be an option for me but um if they're going to roll it out slowly before it comes to streaming then i think that's a good thing yeah um cool yeah in Ashford city uh one of two wes anderson movies that supposedly is coming out this year oh i didn't know there was another one but there uh, is another wes anderson i mean i don't know you know i mean i guess tbd but uh he has asteroid city which i think was expected to drop this summer and then uh another title for the fall uh, I am trying to vamp here while I look up the name of it. Yeah, that's okay, John. I'll talk some more about some other things that we've heard for um, some like A24 dates and stuff that I'm looking forward to from them. I don't, they're not necessarily playing the Cannes Film Festival, but uh, one of the, the big talks about Sundance was this movie called Past Lives. And uh, they, they seem like they're going to release that in theaters limited in June. And then that film that you wanted to see, the uh, Nicole mm. Hall of Center film, um, You Hurt My Feelings is what it ended up being called. And uh, that's going to come out, I think, sometime in May. The trailer's out for that. So, uh, oh, Cool. Um, the other Wes Anderson movie is called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Uh, it is based on a Roald Dahl book. Uh, it stars Ray Fiennes and Benedict Cumberbatch, Ben Kingsley, Dev Patel. So that is the supposed fall Wes Anderson movie. Expected 2023, so we'll see. Uh, but busy year. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. I think we talked about this on the on our preview for the year back in January that, at least for me, not to put words in your mouth, but I think there was some alignment there, but um, I was more, way more excited about this year, upcoming year for movies than I was last year or really any year for the last few, certainly since the pandemic, probably even before that. So uh, I'm excited to see what, uh, you know, Con is going to be like the big official, I think, kickoff for stuff that we can really be looking forward to. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think like Letterbox posts like what the movies are coming out each month and like they showcase like even April. And I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of things in April that I would like to see, like at least seven films I was looking at. I was yeah, like, oh, that's that's pretty high. Beginning of the year hasn't been that bad. You know, yeah. I think I, I've only I've only been to the movie theaters twice, but I mean, like, but yeah, better I mean, than it usually is. Yeah, I guess. Um. Okay. Very good. So, uh, one other thing, I guess, tangentially con related. Um was that the uh, head of the festival, Thierry uh, Fremo, Fremo, um, apologies if I mispronounce that, um, had a very strange, uh, uh, I guess... Statement, interview. if you will. Yes, yeah, statement, thank you. Uh, where he said that he um, thought it was uh, disappointing that, uh, I guess, Steven Spielberg didn't win the... Um, best uh picture oscar for uh the okay. fablemans and uh th thinks it's weird that uh non-american films uh can win oscars and specifically parasite he's uh, cited um from 
2019 at 2020 Oscars. Very weird to me since it was a Palm d'Or winner. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it says that like the Oscars are for American movies and the um, Cesars are for French movies. And I didn't know this, the Spanish film industry awards is called the Goyas, um, uh, but they should be for Spanish movies and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, this is very strange. Um, what do you, what did you, I mean, what else is there to say? What did you think about this? <laughs> well, I, I, I put on the quickly, uh, dilapidating social media service that I thought it was, uh, a load of shit that, uh, <laughs> that he would feel this way. Cause I was just like, yeah, the, the Academy is kind of held up to be like the pinnacle of all these film festivals. And, or like f- film awards and uh-huh. like it's it tries to celebrate all different international films and i mean it, it's not perfect by any means no. but um i think that that has been the mission or the dream of it i mean if they want to do an american uh thing i mean you could probably pick a you could probably pick one of the zillion <laughs> awards bodies that that champion american film or just just make it like uh, and all the MTV Movie Awards, if you want to. Well, the uh, AFIs. Sure, that that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's very strange. I mean, I don't really get why. Like, obviously, all these movies are going to have in the at the Oscars like uh, some kind of a uh, bias toward you know American productions. I think the the expansion of the Academy and the types of individuals that they've been inviting to become members of late has i think brought in the scope of the um awards and and made international films much more of a player than they have been in the past um but nevertheless like there was one foreign language film nominated for best picture out of 10 uh that doesn't happen every year i feel like maybe you know, just off the top of my head, four out of the vast, like, six or so years have probably had one. I don't think we've ever had more than one. So it's not like, like, we're abandoning American movies. Um, if anything, uh, you know, if, if if it did become more of an international, like, award and, like, there was, you know, seven out of ten were foreign language films or came from abroad, like, I would hope that that would be a wake up call for like a deteriorating uh, American movie industry, which is happening, <laughs> uh, and that they maybe they'd like refocus on quality, um, uh, which I would love for that to happen. But um, you know, it just seemed really out of place and strange. I, I I don't really get where it's coming from. Like, it seems like a guy like the Fablemans and and talked a lot about Babylon as well. Um, like, yeah, I okay, mean, like, cool. I think, he, I think he even mentioned like. He wasn't sure why Triangle of Sadness was like by like a Swedish filmmaker, but yeah, it was. Well, he was saying that like he didn't get why that wasn't a best international, um, why that couldn't compete for some sort of international Oscar award because it's in English, but it's, you know, a production, I guess, was not American. In America, yeah. Um, and it's tough too because like remember you just a few years ago like a film like Minari was is, is very much a American film but like there was yeah. a lot of discuss about discussion about like oh should it be like a foreign film right because I think it was not am I correct in remembering that it was not nominated for like foreign film because maybe not enough yeah I think so yeah, yeah. Or, I mean all that stuff's a little bit over my head but. <laughs> or, or too, too much minutia to even care right yeah it's really like just not my concern <laughs> yeah. um but uh but yeah it was just i don't know i don't really get what this guy was on about so uh so whatever you do you thierry framo and um hopefully you can just uh, program some good movies you know, for us save and, american uh, movies at your french film festival what just program some good movies for us and <laughs> yeah that's it that's it that's it. that's literally all we're asking um so uh so yeah uh i don't think i mentioned this up front but we're uh, gonna talk uh the director alfonso Cuaron in our main feature which we're at right now so um sorry for the delayed uh delayed uh you know topic mention there but um you had asked me to program this episode and uh i realized at some point in the past uh week or so that like i had not watched any movies and i was very ill prepared to record an episode with you 
So I said, what what could I possibly do based off of what I've watched lately? And I was like, hey, I watched two Alfonso Cuaron movies. Let's talk about him. And he said, that sounds good. So uh, we're going to do that. Um, what are your thoughts on Alfonso Cuaron? Oh, I, I, I really loved him as a director. You know, um, he was brought on stage years ago along with his cohorts, uh, Inuritu and uh, Guillermo mm-hmm. del Toro. They're, they're known as like the three amigos of uh, mm-hmm. of Mexican film and like really uh, made Dude, Who huge... dubbed them the three amigos? Do we know that? <laughs> because I I'm like, I don't, I'm wondering like, you know, is that something that like some cheeky Americans decided was funny at the time? Or is this something that they have embraced and dubbed themselves that? I think that they were given that nickname. I, I don't know how they feel about that. So yeah, um, I, I, I guess I just wanted to put that out there. But um, but please continue. Yeah, and the, the, all three of them were thought to be uh, catalysts to bring uh, a new excitement to American film. You can um, now look at all three of those directors, and they have won numerous Oscars between them. Um, Del Toro now with like two Best Picture winners. Um, of course, best animated and, and best picture, and then um, Koran himself has the best director Oscar two. and uh, two. That's right, and uh, Inuritu also has, I believe, two best director Oscars. Um, so they uh, definitely prolific in Hollywood. Um, I, th- I think Koran, like he, he I don't know. If I, I want to say like he doesn't put out as many movies as his peers um it might feel that way because he's he's i feel like he's very um particular with what he does he's, he's like a perfectionist um yeah he's definitely been like he go, moves at a slower pace or has moved at a slower pace for the last really almost two decades than either of the other two directors that you you know that he gets mentioned with um you talked about all the best director oscars and over a six year span, the three three men we are talking about had five of the best director Oscars um, <laughs> from twenty fourteen to twenty nineteen, which is just kind of insane to think about. But uh but yeah, no, I think you're right. He definitely seems like he's a little bit more deliberate about what he does. I don't know how much of that is uh based in previous experiences or if it's more just kind of the way he the way he works. Um but yeah, he's only made, um, you know, what, three movies since uh, 2006. So um, uh, somebody who, you know, we maybe shouldn't have waited around for his next title to come out to do an episode on him. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lord knows when that's going to happen. I don't see anything. In the, oh, yeah, I do see some stuff upcoming pre-production. So, uh, but who knows? You know, I mean, that's that's it's not uncommon on IMDb for uh for directors to have a whole bunch of things that uh, are in production that never see the light of day um but uh alfonso Cuaron um started he made um a few shorts um in the 80s um directed a, a spanish language television show uh in the uh from 1989 to 1990 and then his first uh feature film came out in 1991 called solo con tu pareja which uh, I have never seen, and I'm assuming you have not either, Max, correct? That's correct, John. My my, my first blush, uh, you would say, with uh, Koran didn't come to uh, his international sensation, Itu Mama Tembian. Ah, yes. Yeah. So we'll we'll breeze through the 90s real quick, but I believe Solo Con Tu Pareja is in the Criterion Collection if you're interested in checking that out. Um, he did A Little Princess in 1995, uh, and then uh, one of my favorite, like very specific uh, sub genres of movies, which is the Ethan Hawke stars in a modern uh, interpretation of a literary classic from the late '90s and early 2000s. Um, and he did uh, Great Expectations in 1998 with Gwyneth Paltrow as well. Um, so uh, uh, then, uh, as you mentioned, uh, turn of the millennium, I guess you could say. And uh, here he is with Itu Mama Tambien. Yeah, it, I remember my, my first blush with it was, was seeing it on shelves and just knowing like, 
there was like something really taboo about the movie like i it was something like i really shouldn't see it 14 years old <laughs> and uh, i i didn't see it until some time much later but uh I, I think that's one of my most vivid memories of uh, even seeing it at like a local blockbuster. Um, I've never seen it. Oh, it, it is also in the Criterion Collection. It is, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the movie and sort of what you like about it? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, it has two superstars of uh, who have crossed over quite well. In, uh, yeah, for real. Uh, in, in, in America cinema, Diego Luna, who you can see on Andor, um, he he was, had a starring role in Itu Mama Tembien, and the other one, which I'm good, kicking myself that I can't remember his name right now. Um, John, and help me out here. Uh, 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 um, oh God, not Diego. Luna, Gail, Gail Garcia it. Bernal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, he he he's uh, pretty famous too. <laughs> I'd say. Um, yeah, yeah, but, totally. But it's a coming of age story. Um, both men in the movie are are very young, and they go on like this road trip with uh, another woman, and, and um, just kind of like experience life at that age it's 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 kind of hard movie to explain it's like how they explain it on imdb is like in mexico two teenage boys and an attractive older woman embark on a road trip and learn a thing or two about life friendship sex and each other so yeah it's it's about it's about what i explained um yeah i i, I think like does it earn like that edginess that like it's known for i guess so i mean like in the opening t- like a few minutes of the of the movie one of the one of the one of the two actors i forget like is like masturbating he like ejaculates into a pool or something like that um if, if that makes it the movie sound super edgy uh it's not <laughs> um <laughs> it, i mean it, it has it definitely has like young men and, and this woman exploring sex and and just their adulthood and um learning things about themselves uh so uh i i i remember thinking quite highly of it when i when i saw it um i i would probably recommend people check it out as like if if, if you're thinking like the good entrance way probably not <laughs> um obviously he's had uh much bigger uh english language films because this one is is in spanish and um so uh, maybe maybe I'd point you to one of those uh, splashier English language films first before jumping in here. But uh, yeah, I, I think like if you want to see like two like very famous actors at like just beginning and like starting out, it's it's really fascinating even for that. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, I, I guess like we can, as I said, I haven't seen this, so um, I can't talk about it too much, but as we transition to his next movie, is there anything in Itumama Tambien that suggests that the next stepping stone should absolutely be a Harry Potter movie? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it is like a very curious filmography, um, uh, at least, you know, from the 2000s on that we're, you know, somewhat more familiar with, but he does go from this, movie uh kind of sex filled road trip coming of age story to uh the uh third harry potter movie prisoner of azkaban i think a lot of people would say the best of the harry potter movies perhaps because it's directed by alfonso cuaron um but uh you know i haven't seen this in a while uh wasn't super planning on talking about it in too much detail but do you sort of hold true that this is you know among the better movies in the series yeah, it's been a long time for me as well. Yeah, me I mean, like, it's definitely, um, like, if you look at the first two Christopher Columbus movies, those are kind of like flight of fancy, a little, little like hopeful and like very good world establishing, you know, in terms of like the way the castle looks and the score and all that fun stuff. But like, you know, very yeah, like a light, pretty lightweight, and not the greatest made movies. Right, and then this is certainly a, a turn. Um, it's certainly what like 
longtime Harry Potter director David Yates would would he would you would see him kind of like kind of replicate this kind of tone with, with many of his entries. Yeah, for sure. Um, I I I kind of. I, I kind of have my thoughts that, like, I like Goblet of Fire the best for some reason. Of the movies? Though, yeah, I think so. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the first movie I ever took my now wife to on a date to. Oh, well, that's fun. So, so I, I have, I have like, nostalgia built into that one. Mine, as I am sure I've told you before, was Eastern Promises. Yes, you have told me. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, it, was, it, was, it was that swinging dong that really sold her. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna table that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but Prisoner of Azkaban, I will say, um, was when I read the books, um, uh, Harry Potter books. You know, as I was growing up, was always my least favorite of the books. Um, but I really liked the movie, and I gave him a lot of credit for that. For obvious reasons, I think the actors also deserve some credit. They're kind of getting older, and I think can uh take some better direction um uh, yeah just... I, I think like even in that without talking too much about that series that like i think there was a point where like they didn't rely so heavily on the uh, uh acclaimed um yeah. european actors that were in it and like kind of like slowly gave the series over to the children and you know by the time like the fifth sixth and seventh movies and eighth where other came out uh it was really the children had full control over the movie and they were adults yeah uh it's amazing that like they plucked these three kids out of obscurity and they all turned out to be i think pretty good actors <laughs> yeah um i mean they're not at least right. what's that i mean they're all yeah and they're all in their own right i mean like um... they are i mean uh, you know to, to hit on all three of them is i think remarkable and that none of them are like absolute twerp psychopaths <laughs> really i mean it's just it's i think it's a miracle it's amazing and the the twerp psychopath ended up being the woman who wrote the books right <laughs> um uh, anyway uh, <laughs> we could probably move on um i want to talk next about children of men which was the uh his follow-up to prisoner of azkaban 2006 this movie came out i remember it vividly um uh, I saw this movie in theaters and um, it was supposed to come out in September 06 and it got delayed till December. And I remember thinking at the time, I was like, oh man, I was just really kind of getting into movies and kind of the Oscars and all the stuff, like the kind of culture that went along with this stuff. I was like, this must mean that like, it's going to win all the Oscars. And I was so excited. And then I, I was abroad um, in uh, over uh, the winter break that year in college and came home and it was like one of the first things I wanted was like, I have to go see children, man. It must be so good. And I went to the theater and I was like, this movie is freaking amazing. But like at that point, like, I, like the word had got, I was like, Oh, like, yeah, this is like kind of fine. Right. Um, but I was like, no, this is like so freaking good. Um, and I couldn't figure out why like people weren't flipping out about it. Um, and then like, you know what, two years later, Twitter comes, well, Twitter is available and I'm on it. And like, meeting people who are into movies and like kind of like you know when the subject of children and men comes up like everybody flips out and i'm like oh okay like i'm normal like I, <laughs> i'm not the only one who thinks this movie was like a freaking masterpiece but but yeah i've watched it like probably more times than anybody would a normal person would want to considering how like dark and bleak it is but um it's just so well made and i'm always so impressed by something else every time i watch it um obviously i think one of the most uh amazing elements is is how uh long some of the takes are and how complicated those shots are and i'm not a big long take guy as i think we've talked about on the podcast before um but i find the way that he shoots some of these like especially like there's you know a very long uh take and sequence at the end uh, toward the end of the movie with um in like what's kind of becomes a war zone um the way that he shoots that and it was like blood and mud and shit on the camera lens and it's just absolutely insane um and so just uh mesmerizing the way it's it's kind of depicts this like post-apocalyptic world where nobody uh is having children anymore um except for one person who uh just kind of pops up 
in the middle of England. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's just a, a great movie. It's a great Clive Owen performance. And kind of like captured what he does can do best um, at like Pete Clive Owen in the mid 2000s. I, I feel like we've probably touched on this movie like in some way in the past. It's, it feels weird if it's something we haven't talked about. But what are your kind of impressions? Yeah, so I, I would be surprised if we haven't, but it's probably been a while. Um, 148 episodes. It's hard to not remember everything. <laughs> yeah, so, so if you come off another episode where we talked uh, about Children of Men and how much we love it, then I'm sorry. You're going to have to listen to it for a little bit more. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I adore this movie too, John. Um, it, it's one of those things where like, it's a movie that you watch and you're like, Maybe it's not in a quote awards movie, but that doesn't necessarily matter because it's so good. It doesn't need that like pedigree to like tell you that it's that good. Um, honestly, I, I it's, it's funny, John. Uh, this is Children of Men is the only HD DVD I think I own because like I had bought it because <laughs> I, I just I love the movie and I didn't I don't think I had an HD DVD player, but like I just really wanted to own this movie you were big on that technology like uh coming forward <laughs> yeah no i i, I kind of always knew that blu-ray was gonna win so like i i but for some reason i think like the hd dvd came out early for children of men and because like we're well, competing formats and didn't come out for blu-ray for a long time um but yeah i love this movie too you mentioned some of the um the long takes and uh how uh Koran collaborated with Emmanuel Lubetsky on this movie and to make some really stunning uh, cinematography. Uh, later in uh, Koran's career, he, he'd go on to be the cinematographer himself. Um, so I, I obviously I, I'd seen Lubetsky work on other films and he, I think he's a genius, but um, I wonder how much uh, Koran collaborated with him on, on some of that earlier work. Um, not only that, but you you have, I think like the the topic of the movie is like particularly uh, interesting, right? Like there was a lot of uh, coming out of the pandemic. Now it's easy to like look at look at that movie as like another like pandemic movie because like you, you see like how the world is separated and kind of society's falling apart and. And there's these like drugs that, that kind of let people take the easy way out if they don't want to live in this like disaster world anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people not only were looking at movies like Contagion, but also something like Children and Men and how it really prophesized um, not only the, the COVID era, but also something like the uh, almost totalitarian regime of like Donald Trump in, in the presidency and like how uh how everything just seemed to be like a disaster <laughs> um i yeah i i when I, I watched it fairly recently and um i don't remember the time before that when i watched it if it was like pre-trump or post-trump or what but um i i think i had forgotten like how much of it is just about like you know how poorly um, the people in that world treat immigrants, um, uh, really is like very, very, very much of what the movie's about. Um, but, uh, that hit, hit hard. I, th I think for me, uh, this most, most recent time around, um, considering the path that I feel like most of the world is on right now. Um, but yeah, that was definitely, I think, uh, uh, more real than, uh, you, you wished it was and a little bit frightening. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's a really good movie. It's a, it's a tough watch, but I feel like there's enough, you know, Michael Caine's there. He's got some funny stuff and. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's bleak, but it also offers a little taste of hope, you know? For um, sure. Yeah. I, I think like even, even the very beginning of the film, John is very scary. Like the random like terrorist attack and the like. Oh my gosh. Shop. Yeah. First scene. Yeah, so it's just like, and like people are just like walking out of there, like they're used to it, and it's just like, it, I, it's almost like our world today is like when people are are just getting desensitized to like this like crazy violence, and it's just like, oh, too much of it is uh, feels too real. <laughs> so, I remember uh, 
when I was watching it, um, and sort of having this realization that I was like, you know, in the world of this movie, like what's happening here is, you know, probably the most important thing that's ever happened in human history. Um, and that I couldn't think of another movie where that was the case. And I thought that was an interesting just thought experiment. I was like, are there other movies where that's the case? I mean, I guess like, you know, like what, like melancholia or something like that, <laughs> or like something where like the world actually ends. Um, but this is sort of about like that kernel of hope that still exists when everyone else seems to have resigned themselves to the fact that the world is ending and that, you know, I'm going to sort of look out for me and mine while I still can. Um, and, and a few people decide not to because they have something that they can uh, leverage in that way. Um, and it was pretty powerful, but, um, but yeah, yeah I think... I, I, it's funny. Even like Clive Owen's character is not immediately seen as like someone who really is a good guy and wants to go ahead and do it. He almost gets um, drawn into the, to the, the story. Yeah, he does. Right. And it's, it, he has like a really great, you know, compelling backstory of, um, he was married to Julianne Moore's character, um, and they had a son who died, um, and he decided he, like, just kind of retreated within himself. They were both, like, very, like, politically active, and she kind of became more radicalized, as the whole world did, um, and now is one of the, like, most wanted terrorists, quote-unquote, in, in England, um, and he is just kind of going about his business and drinking himself to death. Um, but, uh, you know, he kind of gets dragged back in and we learn all this stuff about him as the movie goes forward, that he's not just a kind of pathetic drunk, like most of the other people around him. He's, he was something and just lost that spark and, and here it's, it's back, you know? Um, uh, but yeah. it's good. It's a good movie, good performance, good direction. Really highly recommend if you haven't seen it before. Um, he would wait, uh, whether by choice or not, I'm not sure. Uh, seven more years before we saw his next movie. I do think there was a lot of like, like I, I'm trying to place myself at the time and, and as somebody who was like really looking forward to whatever this guy was going to do next, like I think I knew it was going to be Gravity or what, you know, a movie about being, you know, uh, 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 disconnected uh, in space um, for a long time. So I think that he was just working on it. I think it was just a complicated movie to get made. Um, but I remember 2013, it was like, uh, Gravity's coming out. I was like, okay, guy, sure thing. Um, but then it, it did. <laughs> um, and it was awesome. And I couldn't believe that, you know, he was won Best Director. And, you know, uh, if not for Steve McQueen, probably would have won Best Picture as well. And uh, Gravity, uh, I also just watched very recently. And um, I, it's funny. I mean, obviously I'm, I am sure I'm speaking for you as well. Like first time I saw gravity was in theaters in 3d and it was one of the few at the time when every movie was being post converted. Gravity was made for 3d. You got to see it in 3d. It's kind of, it's one of the good ones. Um, and uh, it's like a brisk 94 minutes or so, which yes, good job. <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing it with my wife and, and, and she was kind of like, eh, I don't know. I was like, I hey, just see it. It's going to be worth it. worth seeing. And we, she left and she's like, that was awesome. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but uh, not watching it like a ton since then, I feel like because I'm like, it's never going to be as good as it is in theaters. Um, but watching it recently, it's not as good as it was in theaters. It's impossible. Like, yeah. I, and I'd love to see them, you know, it's a 10 year anniversary. I'm guessing it's probably not going to happen, but it'd be so cool to see again um, in 3d. But um it still holds up really well. It's still like a really, really compelling and, and gripping movie. Um, and just like, you know, the first 15 minutes or so, which, you know, I don't want to go back and dissect how many takes or pretend takes there are. I don't remember. But, you know, it's, it's fairly unbroken. And it starts out so kind of like, you know, mundanely or as, as mundanely as a space flight can, you know, they're. They're uh, repairing some sort of module with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney on a space uh, station. And Ed Harris is Houston, which is so funny. <laughs> um, and he's, you know, kind of talking them through things and they're all telling stories and just kind of like, yeah, this is great. We're in space. How cool is this? And then um, all of a sudden, like Ed Harris's voice comes on and he's really 
serious and you could tell like he uh, not just serious but frightened and it's like abort 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 and you're just like oh my god holy shit this is so scary <laughs> uh and then the debris comes flying it's just like oh my god this is the worst thing ever i can't even believe this is happening <laughs> it's just it's a great horror movie it's like it's just the most terrifying thing imaginable yeah like it, it's funny you you mentioned the experience of watching the film john because i i, I... I forget when I first saw it. It might have just been like a normal theater in 3D. And then, like I said to myself, I have to go see it in IMAX in 3D. Because mm. I was just like, if I had the, the chance, I, that's how I wanted to see it. And I remember like just being like in love with the film. And do I find it like a more enjoyable watch than 12 Years a Slave? Absolutely. If yeah. I'm comparing the two of them um uh it, some people can have said that like one of the criticisms against gravity is that it's too much of like a theme park ride and that much of it relies on um you know just your overall reactions to the movie and like maybe like how it would play at home would be different and like you i've seen it maybe once or twice at home since seeing it in the theaters and i i do think that it still kind of holds up I, I think it's still like an entertaining movie I think Sandra Bullock is really, um, she does an excellent job in this movie. She does. I, I'm not, I'm not usually too fond of Sandra Bullock, but, uh, this is her best performance in my opinion by far. Oh, all right. Um, from I, from I what I've seen. Yeah. I think she's very strong in this movie. Um, I, I guess, I guess there's, there's arguments as there are with any ambiguous ending that like, there's a se- sequence later in the film where she's talking to, to George Clooney again, yeah. and they believe like maybe it's just a fantasy that she survived and like she doesn't actually uh, get get to planet Earth. But I don't know. Uh, anybody can make up their own like want of the movie, but the movie goes to great measure to show her uh, get back to Earth. And I remember that there's a sequence right um, when she lands where she's like underwater almost too long. And you think that she's going to drown and you're like, after all this shit that she's <laughs> gone through, it's like, this is going to be the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She gets out of like the space capsule and like, doesn't realize that like, you know, the space suit is too heavy to accommodate her underwater. And it's like, Oh my God, she's just sinking. And you're just like, oh. I remember, I, I do think like in the theater, like everybody's grown at the same time. Like, Oh my God, no. <laughs> yeah. Like after um, all that. Yeah. But then she comes up and, uh, it's great. I mean, lots of really cool imagery too, not just like the long takes and the spinning and whatnot, but like, you know, there's that great shot of the first time she like gets back into one of the space stations and she's kind of floating and looks like she's got like an umbilical cord coming off her and she's in a womb, you know, and then at the end she's, she's kind of taking her first steps and it's just like really, really cool, um, symbolic stuff. Um, yeah, and if, if you, if you want to make Max like a movie, make a space movie, because, like... I yeah, I did, right. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, this is one of them. This is the uh, this is the Alfonso Cuaron space movie, and uh, he checks out. Yeah. Um, so then he, you know, is a Best Director winner um, and can kind of do what he wants, and he says, hey, Netflix, give me whatever I want to make a coming-of-age movie set in my home country um and in black and white and uh let's let's do this thing and they say yes let's do that thing yes and that ended up being his oscar nominated film roma which you know was uh many thought the front runner for best picture of the year it came out and um would it would have been the first to to break that barrier yeah that would happen a year later yeah um but uh, Roma received a, a number of nominations, and um, yeah, I I know I I believe that you're not too fond of Roma, from what I remember. Yeah, I'm not super fond of it. I don't dislike it. I uh, can certainly admire, you know, the way that it's made and some of the acting and stuff. But um, for me, it's just one of these coming of age movies that I don't really relate to or connect with um it's no armageddon time right no it's not it's not armageddon <laughs> time. that is one that i connected to and related to and found really really lovely um but roma i found to be uh you know fine um 
of, of course, this, this movie is not particularly about Alfonso's life. No, and it's not about um, uh, a maid that that worked in his family home, and uh, pretty much goes over her life, and not only that, but like major moments, uh, in in that era. Yeah. What? What? So, I mean, you. I know you like it. You. I'm sure if we went back to our, you know, best of 2018 episodes, that you would have rated it highly. What is it that you feel like you responded to so much? This idea of her family and like trying to fit into that world. I mean, obviously, the conclusion of that movie is absolutely heart wrenching and like. Oh yeah. Um. Like completely devastating yeah uh but i also really liked a lot of the cinematography in the movie and um liked the the black and white and like how the camera kind of like uh, it moves over moves over the action in almost like a dreamlike state it's not like it, it really acts as though like we're we're, we're not actually there in those scenes but like we're almost like reliving them in a another fashion and i i remember like i think like i saw it i saw it twice in the theaters like i saw it at tiff during its premiere there and then i saw it again at like uh a netflix theater in in boston when it was still open and uh that was that was a great night john they gave they had like open like food bar <laughs> for that screening, <laughs> uh, so like I was like, oh, free food and getting to see Roma again. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, and then then I could hear even like the sound design a lot better uh, the second time that I saw it, and um, just like really uh, small details uh, in the sound design, and I don't know. I I think that it just that kind of movie. I, I haven't really seen something where uh, the focal point was from someone of that nature. And uh, it was still early going in these like director <laughs> made films. I mean, like I think there was like maybe one or two before Roma, but Roma was really like seen as the like, Oh, this is the de facto way to do it. And like, <laughs> And, like, this is the way everybody should do it from now on. And then you've got, like, ten more of them. And yeah, um, everybody has their own idea. Like, what was that movie um, Kenneth Braganaugh did, right? Like, yeah, Belfast. Yeah, <laughs> that was his. That was the worst. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I almost dislike Roma more than I probably should for setting off this trend of mediocre... Uh, biopics that um directors want to make of themselves or someone they know um because i just loathe that genre of movies armageddon time aside um and uh but you know i definitely can admire the way that this was shot and i probably should give it another chance sometime it's just the time it wasn't something i really connected with and was a little bit perplexed why it was I think the movie that everybody fell for that year when I thought there was others that were more worthy, uh, green book, not among them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and that's kind of where we're, where we've left off. So before we kind of, uh, leave Alfonso Cuaron until his next movie, um, I asked it after E2 Mama Tambien, but like, what is kind of the thread that you see if, if there is one amongst like the films that you've seen of his, what you're like saying like maybe like one of the themes of his movies yeah, it's just or... like what do you think of when you think of alfonso Cuarón movies like is there something that can, that ties these all together or is it just like a guy who's kind of pushing the boundaries of what he can make and trying to make them in as best a way as he can or is there like a thematic kind of uh commonality it doesn't seem like there there is too much right like at first like you would say like his his partnership with Emmanuel Lubitsky and like how these films look and his 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 want of making these like long uh, sequences like those are certainly mm -hmm. some trademarks you could pull from his films. Um, of course, Inaritu would go ahead and do his own long take movie with Birdman. <laughs> um, 
but uh, I don't know. I I think the I I think Quran likes to just do what he wants to do because like they're so different. It's like how do you follow up a movie like Gravity, which is like this very expensive science fiction film roller coaster ride to to like this deeply personal like drama. Um, yeah. It's a good question. I mean, it almost feels like somebody who like deliberately wanted to go back to his roots after after doing something that was probably extremely challenging for a lot of reasons, you know. Um, but it's hard to say for sure. Maybe he thought like, you know, I, I want to make this movie and, and this is my chance to kind of uh, cash my chips, right? I just won an Oscar. Like, am I ever going to get a chance to do this if I don't, you know, hit another home run? So I better do it now. I think that like if you look at some of the movies we talked about, there's a lot of like really just interesting character journeys that I think he kind of goes on from um, uh, Clive Owen and Children of Men to Sandra Bullock and um, Gravity to uh, I believe her name is Yalitza Aparicio in yeah. uh, Roma. Um, I think he, I guess you could say something about Dana Radcliffe uh, among them, but yeah, that's a tougher one to connect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but uh, and the and the two two guys and uh, Itu Mama Tambien, I suppose. But um, but he does kind of interesting character studies in extreme kind of circumstances and in like really just vivid settings. Um, I guess maybe that's if I wanted to try to make a connection, I'd probably say something like that. But um, definitely, some yeah, of the te- he, technical he, elements fit too. Yeah, he's not as easy as to define as like Christopher Nolan and saying like Nolan's obsession with time, right? It's right yeah, like, like that—that's something that's very easy to to pick out over the course of those movies. Yeah. Um. I and, and as as like Koran as a person, yeah, I, I do believe that he probably is a perfectionist, and like I I get the sense that he's definitely much more guarded than um his peers i mean certainly uh, del toro seems like the type of guy who who will talk to anybody and just like uh kind of friendly uh, outlook from what from what he gives to um cinema as a whole and to the press but um yeah i i it seems like koran is a little bit more guarded uh, maybe we'll learn about what he's doing in another three years and uh be surprised yeah no i mean i'll look forward to whatever it is um, he definitely is somebody who, you know, if he's got a title, uh, on the docket for a given year, like, I'm like, okay, like which category am I fitting it into on our most anticipated episode? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it was fun to talk about some of these and, um, you know, I'd love to one day go back and watch some of the ones that I haven't seen, including, uh, Itamama Tambien, as I mentioned, but, um, I think, uh, we'll wrap there on Quaron. And uh, we'll do a quick what we've been watching shortly. But before we do that, we'll let you know how you can follow us. Uh, our podcast is on Twitter at It's the Pick Pod. And Max, you're at MH Colville. Um, you can also send us an email at It's the Pictures at gmail.com with your favorite Alfonso Cuaro movies or uh, anything else. Just to let us know why you think uh, uh, foreign movies should be considered for Oscars or what you're most looking forward to from the con film festival this year anything that's on your mind um you can subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting app and while you're there please leave us a review five stars will help other people discover and enjoy the show and you can follow us on letterboxd at it's the pictures um where you can see what we've been watching and some cool lists and other fun stuff uh, finally there's the Substack. it's the pictures.substack.com where max is writing regularly what are you writing about of late max uh, I think most recently there was a uh, more lengthy review of the uh, Damien Chazelle movie Babylon. I, I received a 4K for review and wanted to talk about that one a little bit more. Um, and then uh, I plan to do a more thorough review of John Wick 4, which I'll briefly talk about shortly. And, um, you know, there's some other things that I'm, I'm going to review soon. Uh I was I was uh, looking into um, how to blow up a pipeline. Uh, a oh yeah, I've heard that, good things. Uh, that uh, played at TIFF last year, so uh, that should be uh, up on the newsletter too. Uh, very good. Why don't you jump right into John Wick? Okay, yeah. So 
Uh, I have always been um, pretty fond of these John Wick movies, as, as John knows. Yeah. Um, I I, I kind of consider his like what they call like gung fu as like his kind of um, Harold Lloyd or like silent comedy type of uh, routines because there's a lot of choreography that goes into these. They're like really elaborate dances, so it's, and obviously not. Uh, that that's that's what goes into these uh really elaborate uh fight scenes and uh certainly each series each entry in the John Wick series tries to outdo the last one and uh this one has uh somehow even outdid the third one it's it's like i think either at 2 hours and 30 minutes or over 2 hours and 30 minutes of just like nonstop action and like they find new ways to like kill people <laughs> uh in this movie that they haven't before and like yeah do i think like you get numb to it after a little while you do and that might be like the biggest like reservation i'd, g- I'd give people like if if you found like the ever movies tedious because like you just get tired of watching bodies hitting the floor or like or just crazy ways that people get maimed then i could get that you're not really into it but um if you realize that these are like just so ridiculous that they're almost like comedies and like you can laugh along with it then and you, you can really find a lot to like with it and like it's funny i was telling my wife before we went to go see it i was like don't look at me strangely if like i start laughing when someone gets like horribly horribly maimed because like <laughs> that's what these movies are. And I'm like, when I went to see John Wick three in the theaters, I I was like barreling laughing, like how, how violently these guys were getting like maimed by dogs. Like that was like one of the big things <laughs> in John Wick three. And I'm just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna laugh. And it's funny. We, we both sat there in the theater together and we, we watched this epic and, and she was even laughing at some of it because of how ridiculous it is. And um, it, it, it is a, a funny movie at points. And, um, uh, Donnie Yen from the Ip Man series uh, has a huge part in John Wick Four, and uh, he adds he adds a lot with his his new character. Um, and uh, I I think like people who are into John Wick will certainly enjoy this. There's no reason why they wouldn't. For me, like even though this was long, I was like, yeah, I could do another one of these. Um, I think you're going to. Yeah, they they, they had said like the that they had planned this one to be like the final one but since like it out it's doing better than the third one of the box office and like the the reviews are really good that like maybe they'll have to get john wick out of retirement as well i mean like the movie kind of tries to wrap up the john wick franchise with its ending but like it leaves just enough room that like you could have some doubts (laughs) and they could leave the door open for a new one so um we'll see if another one comes around I, i know like Lionsgate, the studio that puts it out, has like a bunch of spinoffs in play, including like mm-hmm. Ballerina of Ana de Amaras coming out like next spring or summer. And like, that's fine. I don't know if like, I don't, I don't know if it's a, the idea that these movies have like really phenomenal stunt teams and like just Keanu is also really into doing his own stunts, not unlike Tom Cruise. That really gives these movies another dimension than just like, I don't know, your your everyday action films. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, like, talking to my wife about the movie, she's like, I really appreciate like how the camera in these John Wick movies pulls out from the action, and you get to see the entire body of the actors in these fights, as opposed to like a lot of the movies post like Batman Begins. Um, do these like really uh, close up action sequences where oh, like, no, it's the worst. quick cuts and like you can't see what's going on and like, you you were talking about it, right John when you were talking about uh, Spider Man No Way Home and I have out, like a li- a a like an actual like, to, like I had an actual like existential moment of dread and horror and depression when I was watching Spider Man No Way Home. <laughs> just like, oh, that's it like like we're just not ever gonna go back to making good action movies anymore like you know this is what people want now and that just bummed the shit out of me 
but, but luckily, things like uh, The Way of Water, J- James Cameron still knows how to shoot an action sequence. and uh, Yeah. Then you got Just have to wait 13 Lick. years, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll have much more to talk about on John Wick on the newsletter, probably, because I, I, I wanted to go long on it. So, uh, Cool. Very good. That. And uh, John says I get to monopolize what we've been watching this week, because he's uh, been not watching too much. I haven't even watched Succession yet. What? I know. Oh, God, that was so good, too. I'm looking forward to it, but uh, I haven't gotten there yet. So that's just... Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I had to make you podcast, and I, I know. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> but just to give you a sense that, like, yeah, I haven't really been able to fit many movies in. I haven't even watched, like, my most anticipated show ever. So, um, uh, so please, yes, the time is all yours. Yeah, uh, but, like, even the movie theaters, John, I'm looking forward to seeing... Um, Dungeons and Dragons and Super Mario Bros. Yeah. Those are like two movies that are coming out within the next like ten days. So uh lots of things to see. Um, but if you don't want to go to the movie theaters or if you have a Hulu account and looking for something new to watch, I would suggest you turn to Rye Lane coming out um I believe this Friday on Hulu. And it's this um British uh rom com but uh, it's a little bit much more than that, right? It stars uh, actors David Janssen and Vivian Opira. Dave, David Janssen is a young man who has uh, recently broken up with his girlfriend after a long relationship. And not he, he didn't get broken up with. He, he, he got dumped, right? And, um, and he's at this museum event for a friend of his. And he's, 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 crying, he's crying in the bathroom stall, right? And uh, this this woman played by Vivian Opira comes in and uh, hears him, sees his shoes, and then like sees him back out into the hallway um, of, of the of the event that they're at the the um, viewing of the, the the paintings, if you will. And um, she and him decide to just talk and walk a little bit, and it begins to feel a little bit like before sunrise. Um, the way that these two people just suddenly meet up and they're and they're talking and they're kind of throwing ideas off each other, and uh, they seem to have a lot of chemistry together, um, and until, until the the actor David Johnson says that not only has he recently broken up with his girlfriend, but now he has to like meet up with his ex and her new boyfriend at. A, a restaurant because they kind of want to apologize that he like caught them cheating on him and uh <laughs> and that like he's like not looking forward to that so he's like oh i'm gonna go but I'm not looking forward to that and then so surprise surprise um she the woman he was with ends up joining him for for that function and uh a lot more happens after that during the course of this movie but yeah it kind of remind it reminded me a lot of before sunrise and it, it's it's really funny and cute um it, it played at sundance and uh there was a lot of good mentions for it there and i was like when i got an opportunity to screen it i was just like yes i definitely want to see this because it was reviewed really well and um I, I think if people are looking for something to watch at home this weekend uh i I'd highly recommend rye lane sounds like something i'd enjoy watching yeah, it, it, it's it's really good, John. I mean, yeah. like it's it's breezy. It's an hour and twenty two minutes. Oh, 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 now we're really cooking with gas. <laughs> uh, that's wow. Uh, okay, looking forward to this. Definitely on my list. Thank you for recommending it. Yeah, no problem. Um, anything else that you want to plug or mention before we jump here? No, I, I, I got some articles coming up, and um, the, the newsletter is uh, moving along quite well. Uh, I think we're good. We're going to come back here in two weeks. Maybe maybe we'll uh, have seen some more movies. Maybe I'll get to the theaters for D&D and Super Mario. We'll see. Um, but, oh, John, and also, like, Tetris comes out on Apple TV+. Plus. That's something I very much want to see. So. You're excited about Tetris? Absolutely. Okay. Why wouldn't I be? Because it's a Tetris movie. <laughs> yeah, but I love Tetris. I'm I'm looking. I I, I have my game, my board games in front of me where I record, and 
One of them is a pu- a Tetris puzzle. Oh, that's um, cool. So I'm I'm looking at Tetris right now, and I don't know. I I I, I like the idea of. I mean, obviously, it's not like. It's not a monster movie where like the tetrominoes are going to like fall on people and kill them. It's 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 about like kind of getting the rights to Tetris for Nintendo so that they could publish the game for Game Boy yeah. <laughs> or the or bring Yeah, Nintendo. no, I mean it's it doesn't look so bad. I'll probably watch it. I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm excited about it, but uh, yeah, but no, Dungeons I mean, and like... Dragons. I'm weirdly excited about just just based off of the buzz. Yeah, the bus is pretty good. I'm, su- I'm surprised. Like, I thought like they they'd Me really too. like not be able to make a com- like compelling movie from that source material. But uh, I'm glad they figured it out. I obviously they had a lot of money playing on it. I think like Dungeons and Dragons is one of the um, biggest brands for Hasbro outside of like Wizards of the Coast, which does the uh, the Magic the Gathering series. So, uh, oh, okay, it's, it's very important for. Uh, Hasbro to to get a good movie out of this franchise. Well, cool. I hope hopefully it works out. Um, yeah, all, especially because uh, you know, uh, Hasbro Hasbro hires a lot of Rhode Islanders. <laughs> oh well, there you go. Even better. Yeah. Um. All right. Beautiful. Well, hey, we'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.